Confused about expression of interest or EOI? How is this done and why you need to do this correctly? In the last few weeks, I posted an overview of Subquest 491 Scaled Regional Visa and why I believe that this visa might be the only good visa for you. I also posted the good and the bad points about this visa. So if you have not read them yet, please see the links in the description. Now following that post, some of you ask what is EOI and how it is done. So to answer those questions, I prepared this short video to give you an overview of what EOI is and the common mistakes that you need to avoid when lodging an EOI. So let's go to Auspac Visa Classroom, where I teach and explain some concepts about Australian visa applications. Our goals are to understand these concepts to successfully obtain a visa to Australia. My name is Teresa Cardona. I'm a lawyer and a registered migration agent from Auspac Visa. Okay. So let's jump into it. Now you need to understand that all skilled visas require an applicant to pass the points test before lodging an EOI. Now the current pass mark is 65, but you will have a better chance of get, getting invited to lodge a visa application if your score is higher than 65. Now at the moment, most invitations in Subquest 491 range from 75 to 95 points. Now, there are some few points that you need to know about EOI. Number one, EOI or expression of interest is within the Skill Select. Now, Skill Select is a portal within the Department of Home Affairs website where you declare all your claims about yourself, the type of nomination or sponsorship that you intend to apply, your age, your employment experience in and out of Australia, the qualification that you obtain in Australia or overseas, your partner's credentials, and all other relevant matters about you that could attract some more points. Like for example, you get some more extra points if you have completed a specialist education such as in the areas of natural and physical sciences, IT, engineering, or other related technologies. You can also get some more points if you have a certificate in language interpretation and translation. And you can also get some more points if you completed a professional year in Australia. Now remember, all the claims that you put in your EOI have corresponding points. Second point, you need to lodge an EOI if you are applying for any skilled visa that is points tested. You cannot directly lodge a visa application unless you have an invitation. The visas that are points tested are the skilled independent visa subclass 189, the skilled nomination visa subclass 190, the business innovation and investment visas, and of course, subclass visa 491 skilled regional visa. Now the third point, EOI is not a visa application and will therefore not entitle you for a bridging visa while waiting for an invitation. Okay, the fourth point, EOI is free. It is free to lodge an EOI, but once submitted, it will be valid for two years. And because it is only an expression of interest, you can access it anytime and you can update it as often as you like. Remember that if you receive an invitation, that invitation is based on the claims you made in your EOI. So it is very important that you update your EOI if something has changed in your circumstances. Now, what are the circumstances that may affect your scores and that you need to update in your EOI? Well, I'll give you some examples. Now, if you gained a new work experience, you need to update your EOI. Or, if you have obtained a higher education than the one you have previously claimed, you also need to update your EOI. Or, say for example, you have obtained a higher English score than before, or your family composition has changed, meaning you get married or had a child, update your EOI. And of course, if you lodge multiple EOIs, you have to update all of them. Now, the fifth point is that your EOI will be removed from Skill Select if you receive two invitations and you don't lodge a visa application. Now, after that, even if you lodge a new EOI, it is unlikely that you would get another invitation. And another thing, your EOI will be removed from Skill Select if you have lodged for a different type of visa and that application was already granted. So in simple sequence, to lodge a subquest 491 or other skilled points tested visa, the usual process would be first is do your skills assessment, second get your English tested, 
Third, you submit your EOI for subclass 491 or other skilled points tested visa. Fourth, you wait for your invitation. The invitation should indicate which state nominated you as an applicant. Fifth is apply to the nominating state. And sixth is once application is approved by the state, you can then apply for your visa with the Department of Home Affairs using an EMI account or through your registered migration lawyer or agent. Now in some cases, step number four, waiting for invitation, and step number five, applying for your nominating state, can interchange depending on the processing requirements of the state or territory. You can also get an English test while at the same time waiting for your skills assessment. Or, you may also want to do the English test before applying for skills assessment because some skills assessment authorities do require a proof of English as part of the requirement. So, while we always encourage you to seek the help of a registered migration agent or a lawyer to increase your chance of successful application, we know that some Filipinos do their visa application on their own or sometimes with the help of their families and friends. While some people think that this is a cheaper way, it is not necessarily so. In fact, there is a huge number of wasted invitations that took away the chances of those who rightfully deserve to be invited because some people claim something that they are not. And there is also a high percentage of visa refusal due to simple mistakes. Now, what are the common mistakes in lodging EOI and how other people blew the chance of getting a visa? Now, the first mistake, lodging an EOI without skills assessment or without English having properly tested. Now, you have to remember that once the invitation is issued in view of the claims you made, you will only be given 60 days by the immigration to lodge a visa application. Now, this 60 days is not enough to obtain a skills assessment. Well, English test, although it can be obtained immediately, there's no guarantee that you will get the scores you indicated in your EOI. Now, the second mistake, forgetting to update the EOI. Remember that the invitation is issued by the immigration based on the claims that you made. Without updating, say for example, your improved English level, you might miss out in the invitation rounds. Now, in the same way, if you fail to update, for example, that you have married or started a de facto relationship and then an invitation was issued based on your previous claims and then you still proceed with your visa application, your visa application is likely to be refused as your score would be lower than the invitation score. Now, the third mistake, claiming for points that you cannot prove. Now, understanding the correct interpretation and application of each criteria in the points categories is very critical in claiming for points. Now, for example, an Australian study requirement has a legislative meaning that does not cover any or all of the courses undertaken in Australia. Now, claiming for five points in this category for a study that is not recognized for the purposes of subclass 491 or other points tested visa it can amount to false or incorrect information and can therefore result to visa refusal. Now, the fourth mistake, you lodged the EOI but did not lodge an application for state nomination in the relevant state. Now, the state nomination process is overly complex and time-consuming, believe me. Now, to understand the requirements, the processing and the timing of state nomination is very tedious. Unless you have the ability and has a high risk threshold, I suggest that this area is best left to the professionals, the migration agents or lawyers. They have the most updated knowledge about this and can make the whole process stress-free. Now, the fifth mistake, lodging multiple EOIs. Now, some people lodge multiple EOIs and that's okay. Maybe because they have multiple positive skills assessment and they want to try their luck at either occupation. Or maybe the EOI has been sitting in the system for quite a while and has not received an invitation. Or maybe they just wish to try their chance in other visa subclasses. Or maybe they just decided to go in any other state that may be open. Now, while multiple EOI may broaden the chance of you getting invited, it may also decrease your chance of invitation especially if you're looking for state nomination. Now, answering any state may be weak 
as compared to those who only put one state. Now, each state assesses the genuineness and sincerity of each applicant to live, to work, and to state in the nominating state. So, what are my tips? I have five tips for you. Now, before lodging an expression of interest, my tip number one is to make sure that you have already obtained your positive skills assessment for your nominated occupation. And also make sure that that occupation is on the list. Now, my tip number two, ensure that you have sat the English exam and that you have obtained the required level of English you indicated in your EOI. You must have either the IELTS, OET, TOEFL, PTE Academic, or Cambridge Test Certificate. Don't just claim. The score must be in the certificate. My tip number three, if you are applying for a Subclass 491 state sponsorship and if you are offshore, read and research about your state, the economic conditions in the state, the public services, the job, the school, the hospital. Devote some time to know the positive and the negatives about the place. And if you are onshore, you've got to live in the state that you want to approach for nomination. And if you are sponsored by your relative, ensure that you have the permission and that they are eligible to sponsor. My tip number four, although it's obvious, I'll say it anyhow. You need to make sure that your old documents are ready and available. There is nothing more frustrating than searching or requesting for a lost birth certificate, a missing passport, torn or broken transcript of records, employment certificate, etc., etc. Okay, my tip number five. If you are not sure what occupation to nominate and you are in doubt on points allocation or you're just simply feeling that you are not cut to handle the details and the stress in making a visa application, now seek the help and assistance of professionals and reputable migration agents or migration lawyers. Yes, it's true that they charge for professional services, but remember, they are professionals. They are experienced and knowledgeable about the ins and outs in the migration visa processing. Do not risk it. You did not go through the pains of study, skills assessment, and English only to be rejected in the end. So I, as always say, seek the help of a registered migration agent or a lawyer at the start, in the beginning, not at the end when everything is messed up. Because if it's messed up, it will cost you even more. And worse, there may be not enough time. So we want to be with you in your Australian migration journey from consultation to citizenship. So if you have any question or want a migration plan, contact us and we'll be happy to help. If you want this video and if you learn something from this, put your comment below.